As many of you know, I've been gone for the last two weeks, and this is the third installment of a series entitled Behind the Scene, a series involving the power of the Holy Spirit. And I, 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 as I looked at APEC, I thought none of this is possible apart from the Holy Spirit. And the series was really a journey into the book of Acts and looking at the landmarks and the different places where the power of the Holy Spirit manifested in ways that revealed His power to ordinary people like you and me. The starting point of this, as we find, is in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. But you will receive power. In other words, supernatural power is necessary to do the kind of stuff we do. There are certain things you do on a daily basis. You can cook a hamburger. You can, you can go to work. You can ride a bicycle. You can exercise. You don't need the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. It would be good if you did use the power of the Holy Spirit. But, there, but the, in terms of building church, in terms of doing ministry, you can't do it without the power of the Holy Spirit. And it says here that the power of the Holy Spirit will be received by these disciples in the book of Acts. In other words, spiritual empowerment is necessary. I discussed this with you in previous weeks. And the purpose of that was that you will be my witnesses. The purpose of that is not just for us to be blessed, to be us to carry on and do the work that we are ordained to do. The purpose of that is to witness, to make disciples, to reach out to other people. Now, not only that, it's just not making disciples. It says making disciples in specific places. Number one, in Jerusalem, the city that you live in, your neighbors, your friends, your family, your office mates. Beyond that, go to Judea. He says don't reach out just to your friends and family. Reach out to the people in Judea. This would be your neighboring towns and cities. This would be Alabang, Mandaluyong. This would be Quezon City. This would be the periphery around us. And then he says go beyond that and go to Samaria. I was actually just in Samaria. Uh, during our trip to Israel. And Samaria is the place where you have people who live near you but may not necessarily be of the same culture. They may be atheists, agnostics, people who don't believe you, people who see gender identity differently from you, people who are sinners. These are your Samaritans, your Samarians. Samarian, Samaritans, okay? And then finally he says, go to the ends of the earth. Reach the ends of the earth. That's the purpose of the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, we're tracking now in Acts chapter 16 and carrying on with really two of the most powerful messages I've heard from the Holy Spirit, one from Pastor Christian, which he preached before me, and then the other one that Joseph preached last week. But today, we're looking at Acts chapter 16, verse 11. We're looking at three stories. Story number one from Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Samothrace, and the next day, we went to Neapolis. Whenever you see the word polis in the Bible, that means city. Greek word for city, this word Neapolis, it means simply new city. This was a new city that they were entering into. It's a multicultural city, a city that had different kinds of people living in it. Now, it's fast becoming the Philippines in a way. Verse 12, from there we traveled to Philippi. From there they journeyed to Philippi, a Roman colony, clearly. It's not Caesarea Philippi, it's another Philippi somewhere in Macedonia, which is present-day Turkey a leading city in the district of Macedonia, and we stayed there for several days. So they journeyed, they sailed, they journeyed, they went and, w and went over to Philippi and spent several days planning to assault the city and reach out to people. Now, on, those, on one of those listening, they, they, were, they went to a synagogue, to, as they were traditionally did, and one of those listening was a woman from the city of Theatira. Now, Theatira is also today in present-day Turkey, which is not very far from this place, named Lydia. And Lydia turns out to be a dealer in pur purple cloth, which is an expensive kind of fabric in those days. As you know, dyes were limited, and she was a dealer. She was a businesswoman. She was a smart girl. She knew her way around. She was no ordinary person. So she was a worshiper of God. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. You've heard me talk about this previously where Cornelius feared the Lord, generous to the poor, and yet he didn't know who God was and needed to be saved. The same manner that this woman is a worshiper of God and yet still needed to hear the gospel. And the Holy Spirit opens her heart, the Bible says. The Lord opened her heart so that she can respond properly to the message. In short saying this, it's not just our preaching of the word that gets people saved. It requires the move of the Holy Spirit to open their hearts. The Holy Spirit persuades people. 
The Holy Spirit is the power to move on behalf of us, ahead of us, to cause people to be open to his gospel. When I landed last Sunday, I landed at 6 in the evening, and my first stop was to see my grandson, Philip. Amen? Because I've missed him so much. I've been gone for 10 days, and as soon as I landed, I, I spent some time with him. But I realized as I was spending time with him, I was jet lagged. I was getting wonky, and I was getting tired. But I knew that the next day, APEC was starting, and we were going to host over 370 people. And so the whole stretch of the week was just meeting after meeting after meeting after side meeting after side meeting, praying for people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So finally, Saturday, I, I, I crashed. And so this was yesterday. But throughout my stay in Israel, my wife had been texting me about a, a man who I grew up with. And he said he's not doing well. He actually discovered something in his body, and, and he's, he's lost a lot of weight, and he needs prayer. And throughout the week, I couldn't do it because I was here at APEC. And so the only time, and it needed to be rushed that I make it to his home, they've already took him out of the hospital. He's already in his house, and he's living alone because his wife and he have basically parted ways. And so this was yesterday, after yesterday evening, I woke up at 6.30, and my wife, as gracious as she usually is, taps me and says, I know you're tired. I know you've got to prepare a message. I know you've got to do your conversations. I know this and that, but you need to go and see your friend. How many of you thank God for wives who act like the Holy Spirit? Amen? <laughs> I wasn't much as the whole, I was much in the Holy Spirit. And so I said, and so I said, okay, I got to do this. I'm out of my own volition, but there was no strength, there was no energy, there was no desire, to be honest. And then I began to pray in tongues. And, and folks, you've heard me say this over and over. I prayed in tongues like I never prayed. And just, Lord, give me energy, give me strength. And I drove to his home, and as I got to his home, I was knocking on his door. I rang the doorbell, and both doorbells weren't working. And I knocked on his door, and no one was opening. And I called up his, his my wife tried to call up his wife, and, and, and there was, she wasn't responding. We're trying to get across. So finally, I was banging on the door, and finally, somebody hears us, and this lady who's his caretaker opens the door, and we get up. And, and, and so this is a friend of mine that I grew up with when we were in high school. And I walked in there, and I, I, was, I was preparing myself to speak to him. And I sat there and listened to him and just waited. You know, when, when someone's sick, don't preach to them. Amen? That's the worst thing you can do. Don't tell them they're going to go to hell. I mean, sit there and, and listen. And as I was listening, I was praying quietly in the spirit. I was praying in tongues. And please, when someone is sick and they don't know the Holy Spirit, do not pray in tongues like crazy in front of them because you're going to weird them out. Okay? So I'm just praying in the spirit it, under my breath. Lord, help me. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. I don't have the energy. I don't have the strength. Help me. I just listened. Listened to all his stories. We were talking about our high school days, and then all of a sudden, the Lord just empowers me. The Holy Spirit just comes. And I began to take, I took out my phone, and I sat beside him in his bed, and I said, listen, here's what James chapter 1 says. And I read him, James chapter 1, verse 1, verse, I just read the Bible. And then as I read the Bible, he began to break into tears. And I began to pray for him. And as I was praying for him, my wife tapped me and I turned around and for whatever reason, his wife and two sons were standing in front of his bed. It's like the Holy Spirit just set it all up. And at that point, I stood up and I started to preach in the room to the care, to everybody, the care, everybody in that room. It was like a service, amen? <laughs> and my wife said, I've heard you preach, but this is one of your best messages. And I laid hands on him and I said, listen, God wants to heal you. God wants to restore you. The power of the Holy Spirit allows us to persuade the unpersuadable. The power of the Holy Spirit allows us to speak into lives. It was amazing because his wife happens to be a good friend, a high school classmate of my wife. And both of us have been trying to share to both of them in separate occasions. And in this one moment, there we were with their children. Power of the Holy Spirit to witness is in you, it's in me. You don't have, I didn't have the energy. I didn't have the, the ability to do that. When we trust the Holy Spirit to move, 
he will move through us and we will be able to reach out to others. Amen? Now further, in verse 15, it says, when she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. Interestingly, she gets baptized and their whole household gets touched. I remember another story years ago when the church was very, very, our church was very small. Pastor Steve and I were counseling a woman. She's like a Lydia. She was strong. She was smart. She was wealthy. She was successful. But despite the fact that she was a Christian, sometimes when you tell her something, she doesn't listen. How many of you met people like that? They, they, they love God, okay? But when you talk to them, they just don't listen. And she had been separated for many years and estranged from her, from her husband. And I remember one time we were counseling, and this is not the first time we've counseled her. We've counseled her several times, but this is, it's getting frustrating. Every time we counsel her, it's like she doesn't get it, okay? So finally, we're counseling her this time, and we just know, knew this was not going to happen. Nothing was going to happen. In the midst of that counseling, the Holy Spirit gives me a picture, and at the same time, gives me a scent. Not S-E-N-T, S-C-E-N-T. I smelled something. How many of you know the Holy Spirit is capable of that? What I smelled was popcorn. And I'm sitting there, and I, I, the picture I saw was a Christmas tree and a lady in a chair, dimmed lights, just the lights on the Christmas tree, and herself distraught, in despair, depressed, and sitting there. Couldn't see her face. And then I could see the popcorn she was holding. I could smell it. And said, excuse me, I, I just saw something. Can I share it with you? It's there. So I described the picture and the popcorn, and she broke down and cried. And she said, that was me. That was Christmas Eve. And I was all by myself. And my kids didn't even call. Nobody called. And I'm all alone. For all the success, for all the money, for everything I have, nobody cared. And I said, well, God wants to bring healing to your life. And he said, if you surrender, if you start being amicable, if you start submitting yourself to others, God can heal you. And you know the amazing thing? That day she was delivered, she broke down, she was set free. And the amazing thing happened, God restored her marriage. In fact, that woman has come, become one of our most prolific small group leaders. It's amazing what God can do when you and I move in the power of the Holy Spirit and not move ahead of it. And then he invited them to her home. They said, the, the Bible says that he, she invited, stay with me. He was now the one, rather than being just persuading her, now she's persuading them. You stay with me and let's make my house the base. Let's make it the place that can reach others. And if you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she said, I'm persuading you. I'm, I'm asking you to stay with me. On the stage here last week, when they were giving all the country reports, you know, we have reports from all the Stan nations, Kyrgyzstan, Kyrgyzstan, um, uh, all stands. And the only thing that was well, Istanbul is that, they, they, I don't know if that counts. But it was just all kinds of nations, hard nations, tough nations. Nations where you would really extend your faith to believe God. I'm just praying for these missionaries and these pastors and leaders all across China, the Middle East, etc. But there was one report that was interesting. It was a report about the onslaught onto the island of Fiji. Fiji is an island state. And it's got about 300 little islands. And Fiji is not just an island state. It is paradise. If I were to become a missionary, that's where I'm going. Okay. <laughs> So they were giving a report on Fiji. And, 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 and this is Boracay times 200% or 2,000%, okay, bottom line. Okay, so they were giving the report. And the man giving the report was really somebody who studied our school here. And again, I want to commend you. You guys may not be aware of this, but the impact of this church, of leaders from the church, from Pastor Richard, who's actually a disciple of their church in New Zealand, and moved here and stayed with us for a few months and studied with us and learned some of the ropes and said, I'm going to go and plant this church in Fiji, this island nation. And we had the moment to pray for him. Pastor Jared Sunila, who we prayed for on this platform. He's about to go. But here's the reason why I'm telling the story. Because he said, and, I, and I, Richard, you were here when he said this. Alfred, correct me. I hope I'm not exaggerating. He said this. He said, I have... Too many open doors. I don't know where to start. 
I've got open doors with businessmen, with politicians, with hotel owners. I've got too many open doors. And I thought to myself, that's the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's able to open doors. He's powerful. He can persuade. And I remember clearly when Jared was here, we were praying and believing God that he would open doors for him and that he would build a team around him. And now I'm listening to him making this report and saying, I'm about to fly in there. We don't even know where to start. We've got campuses. We've got schools. We've got all these places where we have got open doors to reach people. Holy Spirit moves before us. So I'm making a mistake. It's great to have buildings. It's great to have facilities. It's great to have air conditioning. But to do ministry, you need supernatural power. You need the Holy Spirit. Now further, it goes in verse 16. On when, once when we were going to the place of prayer, here they are again. They're, they're staying now with Lydia. And this is story number two. They're going to the house of prayer, which is basically a synagogue. And they're reaching out to the Jews. And one day when we were about to go to this prayer, place of prayer, we met this time not a smart, astute businesswoman. They met a slave girl, a female slave, who had, had a spirit in her. She was possessed by a spirit by which she predicted the future. In other words, the spirit was so powerful that the spirit could actually predict the future in a deceptive way and allowed people to follow her. And she earned a great deal of money for her owners through this act of fortune telling. So notice it says a, few, a, a slave girl who had a spirit in her. So no, it's, notice how this happens. The Holy Spirit moves and persuades the smartest of the smartest, the richest of the richest. At the same breath, the Holy Spirit is about to move in the life of a female slave. The power of the Holy Spirit to set this woman free. Now, she followed Paul and the rest of us. They're recounting this woman is following me. These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. And how many of you know this statement is actually true? They are servants of the Most High God and they are proclaiming how to get saved. But how many of you have heard somebody say something and yet it's a demon saying it? Amen? That's very possible. In other words, a deception is about to happen. She's actually riding on the coattails of the Holy Spirit's move so that she could block the way at some point. Now, what happens is, verse 18, she kept this up for many days. I mean, she wouldn't stop. She, this demon, together with this woman, just followed them around. And everywhere they preached, she would just say, listen, uh, these guys are, they said the same thing. And finally, Paul becomes annoyed with her. The Bible says he became annoyed. And there's such a thing as Holy Spirit annoyance. Hello. I mean, some of you have seen me get annoyed. And you know some of that's the Holy Spirit. Some of that's my flesh. Amen. And I've apologized for it. But, but the point is there's such a thing as being annoyed because the Holy Spirit causes you to realize there's deception going on here. And a bit of the annoyance is called really in a, in a large way, it's called discernment. You're discerning there's something wrong with the spirit of this person. There's something not right. She may be saying the right things, but the spirit from which it's coming out from is not right. And that's one of the roles of the Holy Spirit is to give you insight and to give you discernment. There's something not right here. And so he was annoyed and turned around and said to the spirit, notice the Bible doesn't say he said it to her, but he said it to the spirit in her and declared to her, in the name of Jesus, I command you to come out of her. Next week, we're going to look at a moment in the book of Acts where in the name of Jesus did not work. But here, he proclaims it and he declares it over the spirit. In the name of Jesus, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. So she got delivered. She got free. At that very moment, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit caused the Spirit to be driven out of her because the Holy Spirit does not just give us the Spirit to persuade people. It gives us the power to deliver people, to set them free, to trust that God can move in the lives of people. Now, on this stage... Last week again, I'm referencing all my stories are from last week. Many of you know when I preach, most of my stories are from the last week or two weeks prior. A lot of these stories are because my mind is so inundated with a lot of the things that happened in APEC. 
On the stage, one of the men that preached, we actually asked him to come to preach to us, was Pastor Shadi Soleiman. So actually, if they pronounce it Soleiman, we call it pronounce Soleiman. Okay, he's actually Egyptian. And Pastor Shadi was a soccer player that was asked to play in the United States. And when he got there, fell in love, married a, an American, and eventually lived in the States and planted our church in Orlando, Florida. If you've ever go to Orlando, Florida, go to our Every Nation Church there. Our Every Nation Church there is in Lake Mary. And it's an interesting church because when you go in, it is a multicolored church. It's white, black, brown, yellow. It's all kinds of people. And Pastor Shadi is the pastor. And Pastor Shadi planted that church, but before he planted that church, he came to Manila. Again, thanking you for your generosity, for your standing. And he, were, he trained here. And he saw how we made disciples and brought our materials and, and connected with us. And then flew to, to, to uh, the States. On his way here, he passed by New York. And on his stopover, he was with his traveling buddy, and they bumped into Manny Pacquiao. And they walk up to him and say, Manny, Manny, you're the hero, you know, this guy. They both didn't realize because they're both huge. They're both athletes. And Manny's a tiny guy. And, then, you know, they didn't realize how small Manny was, but they were both wary of him because they knew that if they had a fight, he could kill them both. <laughs> and so they said, do you know uh, Steve Merle? Oh, Victory. Yeah, of course I know Victory. I use one-to-one. -one. And he, Manny uses one-to-one. -one. He's not from our church, but he uses one-to-one -to, -one to share to people. And so they, they met him and they, they, they got around to him. And Shadi told us a story, which is really my main point. When he got back to the States, he wanted to reach out. The church was nothing. He had 30 people and he rented a room for 800 and he had about 30 people. It was like being in a cave with a handful of disciples. And he began to reach out and try to reach people. And the Holy Spirit led him to a gym. And he began to share to people there. And, he be, and what he would do was, he, it was obvious that he wasn't really there for the gym because he was not losing weight. He was actually gaining weight. <laughs> but the whole day, and the manager noticed that he was doing nothing the whole day. He wasn't even working out. He just wanted to meet everybody. So the manager kind of took him aside. What are you doing here? And so he started to reach out to this manager. It turns out that this manager was ripped and he's, got, he's like an athlete and he shares the gospel to him. But a long story before that was this guy was distraught because, because of all the things that he'd put in his body to build his body, the chemicals and stuff. He'd messed up his body and he couldn't have kids anymore. And his one dream was to have children so he could treat them better than his father did treat him. And through a series of events, and I don't have the time to share the whole story, Shadi basically prayed for this man, baptized this man, led this man to the Lord, and believed God that he could still have children. And today he has two children. Power of the Holy Spirit. You know, when I heard the story, I thought, okay, how, many of that, how much of that is true? But you know what made it so true? The guy he was talking about was sitting beside me at APEC. And he was saying, well, everything Shadi said is true. The power of the Holy Spirit. Where doctors have said this is impossible. And God says it's possible it is. And you and I need to understand, God is not just able to persuade, He's able to deliver, He's able to cause things, He's able to do miracles for us if we will stand, if we believe, if we will witness to people. Amen? Now, finally, verse 19, here's what happens. When the owners realized that their hope for making money was gone, this was the slave girl, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They were mad. In other words, they lost their income source. This is story number three. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing the city in an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Basically, they were thrown in jail and they were said, look, these guys are troublemakers. Put them in the deepest part of the jail and watch them carefully. And when he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell, not just watch them carefully. He literally uh, bound them in stocks, chained them. Now, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a, such a violent earthquake 
that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And at once all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. This is supernatural. This is just the way the Holy Spirit moves. And so the guard, shocked at this, woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword. He was about to commit suicide and kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. Now, I guess you get the context, right? I mean, he's been bullying these guys. He's been abusing these guys. And even Paul and Silas, whom he had just met, he had taken the liberty of chaining them when they were just told to just put them in the stocks or put them in, the, in prison. So he was afraid for his life, knowing that at some point these guys would get back at him. Now, but Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. Fear of God, the work of the Holy Spirit. God's about to move again. The Holy Spirit touches him. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, watch this. Without any preaching, he says, what must I do to be saved? He's probably heard rumors about them. These are the guys who've been preaching about this new salvation. He says, what can I do to get saved? And it's amazing how the Holy Spirit can restore and bring households back. Like this, he spoke to the world and all the others in his house. God is able to change and transform our lives. God is able to cause the impossible to happen. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. And they immediately, then immediately he and all his household were baptized. Entire homes can be saved. Watch what happens here from Lydia to a little bit of this. And God sets them up and yet it expands and gets bigger. Now the jailer brought them into this house and set a small meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had, become, he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Amazing, isn't it? God does not just have the power, the Holy Spirit not just not have the power to persuade or to deliver. He has the power to transform. He has the power to transform lives. The power of the Holy Spirit should never, ever be undermined. When we look into the future of what the church is, when we look into the future of what God has called us to do, let's not forget for all these buildings, for all this equipment, for all these resources, for all these materials, for all the technology and techniques, we can only do this because of the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? The Holy Spirit has the power to persuade. The Holy Spirit has the power to deliver. And the Holy Spirit has the power to transform. Would you stand on your feet as we close with the word of prayer? Just close your eyes, bow your heads, allow him, the Holy Spirit, to speak to you. God, I pray that in this moment you will open our eyes to see places, people, areas, our Jerusalem, our neighbors, our office mates, our friends, Lord, our former classmates. Can you look up here for a minute? All throughout my journey in Israel, I would get a viber message from my wife. And it was talking about my friend. And I know that she had set this up. The Holy Spirit had set her up, constantly reminding me. Because my wife, my wife's just a very sensitive woman. And she kept reminding me, when you get back, your first stop is to visit him. And he's not from your church. He's not somebody, but your first stop when you get back. So she would constantly remind me. And I knew that the Holy Spirit was preparing me because I had issues with this man. Their final meeting was not the best of things. But the Holy Spirit is so persuasive. He persuades not just the unbeliever, He actually persuades you to stay, to go, to forgive, to reach out. And that's my hope for this message that you would see, not just you bring deliverance to others, not just you just seeing transformation in others, but you would see Him, first of all, persuade you, deliver you, transform you, so that you will have the faith that if He's able to do that to me, then He's able to do that to everyone else. Amen? Would you just close your eyes, lift up your hands towards heaven? By faith, believe, Holy Spirit, O God, reign upon us once again. Fill us afresh. Breathe upon us. Persuade us, God, to love you. To 
to love you, worship you. To find our joy, our peace, and righteousness in Jesus. God, I'm asking you, Lord, to deliver. Use us to bring deliverance and cause deliverance in the areas of our lives. And God, I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, oh God, bring transformation to each one of us individually, families, homes, neighborhoods, clans, cities, offices, God. We're trusting and believing you are able to do. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone said, Amen and amen. Well, God bless you. Enjoy the rest of your Sunday.